I don't know how the rest of you guys are doing with your orchards this year, but uh, I've been hearing a lot of people in the Northeast have been having a lot of fruit set this year. And I noticed that with my fruit trees, my fruiting plants, I've probably had this year as I, you really should as you, the years go on have more and more fruit, but especially this year, I've been shocked at how many fruits I'm seeing on my trees. And it seems like everything is fruiting. Um, I'd love to take you guys around my yard, show you guys some of the fruit trees, do a little bit of a tour and talk about some of these things as we go along. Here's actually a nice little bowl of strawberries I harvested yesterday. We ate some of the really good ones, some of the really perfect ones. I think the rest of these I have to probably wash, but it's been a big strawberry year and oddly enough, um, I transplanted them all in just only three months ago. I moved them from a different part of my yard to their new location and they have uh, thoroughly impressed me with their ability to fruit after being transplanted. I, don't, I can't think of any other perennial fruiting plant that you could just transplant and then still have it fruit very heavily and at a high quality as well. These are my two cherry trees that you're looking at. And we've had a, a big year for the fruit set on these cherry trees. This is white gold here on the right and black gold on the left. I would say white gold probably had more of a, a better fruit set to it. Um, and I had to really net these guys because if you don't net them, as soon as they start to turn red, you lose all of them and it happens like that. The squirrels, the birds, everything comes. They see them usually before you do. You lose all your fruit. However, what's been happening, I've had to harvest early this year before they're really perfectly ripe because a lot of them are splitting or cracking. And this cracking that has been occurring because we had really a very dry spring and then we had all this rain come in at once, probably like an inch or so. For those of you in the Northeast, you know what I'm talking about. And that rain, because it was so much, it wasn't consistent over the course of the season. It caused these cherries to actually split and crack. And now that they've been open, the interiors have been exposed to the outside elements. It continued to rain, maybe not even a lot of rain, but just enough to create these very humid conditions and create spoiling, mold, fermentation, rot. So I've had to come in here to these this white gold cherry specifically that ripens before the black gold and harvest uh, prematurely. And that's been really upsetting because that's the whole goal of growing fruit, isn't it guys? To get these fruits perfectly ripe, to enjoy them at a higher quality than what you can get at the store. And cherries are super expensive. They were like $4 a pound. I just bought some at. Um, it cost me like $6 for a little bag of cherries. And you can plant yourself some trees. Maybe it'll take a few years. You gotta take care of them. You gotta net them. You gotta prune them. Assuming you don't have any rain. And I think that's really what the key has been for me at least, is that this tree on the left, this black gold cherry, is gonna actually fruit at a later date. It's a later to ripen cherry. And therefore, uh, this rain that we had earlier in the season didn't necessarily affect it nearly as much. So while I, you know, kind of ruined a little bit of my harvest, unfortunately had to ruin my harvest on the white, the white gold, at least the black gold is going to come through at a later point now. And hopefully I'll be able to ripen some, uh, some really good cherries. So let's move on. We actually have uh, the garden looking crazy right now. I still have to update you guys on that. We're gonna avoid most of the garden stuff in this tour. The peaches are magnificent. I have thinned them. I probably have though, after thinning roughly 60 to 70% of the peaches on these trees, I probably still have about a thousand peaches across, across all the trees I have in this, this property. They're up high, they're down low. They're really uh, super productive this year. You know, there was a lot of flowers we didn't get any frost. And then because we didn't get any frost, we have good pollination here in this yard. There's just a ton of uh, fruits down here. So I'm really impressed. I showed you guys on Facebook actually a photo. I was up in the tree 
from this angle, thinning the tree out. And there was just so many fruits that it was uh, really quite a sight. And, you know, I'm proud. Look at all the uh, peaches on the ground, by the way. I really should come in here. I think the most ideal scenario is to come in here and actually pick these up because you don't want potentially to uh, encourage different pests. But you'll notice if you let even the unripe peaches fall to the ground or you thin them, uh, certain critters will come in here and actually eat the, the cherries and leave behind the pits. I'm not really seeing a great example here, but maybe squirrels and, uh, and or rabbits, maybe the groundhog comes in here and actually uses these as food, which is pretty good. You know, I'm not gonna um, remove them, I think, just for that sake. That way they can get something to eat and hopefully avoid eating some other things in the yard. Uh, the strawberries are looking nuts. I was just showing, just did a video on these guys, but they're so productive, uh, as I showed you guys earlier. I harvested yesterday, and I can come in here again today and harvest probably another bowl just to that same size that I showed you earlier. Um, they're really looking fantastic. The one thing in the yard, by the way, that hasn't actually put out any fruit or will put out a very limited amount of fruit is the apple trees. Quite upsetting. Uh, the grapevines, not all of them, but the Mars in the middle there is filled with grape clusters. We have to bag those very soon. And then I have an Everest seedless on the west side of the house. I'll probably show you that that plant, it's relatively new, relatively young, and it has a lot of clusters on it. I'm really shocked and impressed. Here's the gooseberry. It's just filled with gooseberries. I actually put a net over really this whole area because the plums are ripening here and the espaillade plums. Unfortunately, I can't really get in there to show you guys as much as I'd like, uh, but the plums are gonna ripen, these gooseberries are gonna ripen, and the gumi is ripening. And what's crazy about the gumi, guys, is that it is literally so filled with fruits that it is falling over. Like, this is not, you know, normal. This is even more production than I've ever seen. Uh, there's a branch right down in here that's literally bent over downwards. Uh, look at this. I think I can zoom in and you can, you can see exactly what I'm talking about how much productivity is just right there on that one branch. Um, this is my, f like really it is one of my favorite plants, one of my favorite fruiting plants as of probably a year or two ago. And I've been highly recommending it to a lot of people. I still haven't figured out how to propagate it guys. It's a shame, but these are extremely tasty. There's nothing to harvest just yet. The berries are turning red, but we're still maybe like a day or two away before I can get some really sweet ones. If I get some, some ones that are kind of red or maybe a little orange at this point, they're more astringent than sweet. And I don't mind that. I think it's great to come out here and eat them, but it's not, um, it's not as pleasant. As they, they hang longer, they're red longer, they'll start to dry up, by the way, on the bush, and they'll get a lot sweeter and still retain some of that astringency, which I actually really love. And they should make a great wine. I have down in here, you can kind of make some of those out, some Yosta berries. It's a cross between a gooseberry and a currant. The persimmons, by the way, these are some American persimmons I have planted in a lot of shade. Uh, this is my proc, one of my favorite persimmons for sure. And it actually has some fruits on it that uh, should hold. Last year it dropped its fruits. The year before it held on to some fruits and I was really, really impressed with an American persimmon. A lot of people don't, excuse the uh, noise there that might've been on the microphone. Yeah, we should be good. But uh, a lot of people don't give the American persimmon, I think enough credit and this is a really, really good one. I, f I think the one next to it is called Celebrity. 
And this one has taken many, many years to get established. But even this guy, as fragile as it's been, it's very healthy this year. There is no signs of persimmon psyllid. All the leaves look great. Uh, the branching is coming out well, and there's fruits on it. The real question at this point is, will all of these fruits hold? I've been seeing uh, my rosianca has been getting pollinated by bumblebees. So I know that there's good pollinators with these, and you can see this, this darker flower down there. That's actually one that has been pollinated, and the petals will fall very soon. And it's, you know, it's all over the plant. So this, this one tree in relatively a lot of shade, I mean, I don't, guys, I think this tree only gets about five or maybe six hours of light a day. And it could potentially this year have about 50 fruits on it. Um, I mean, that's the most ideal scenario. Believe it or not, our, persim our, uh, our pawpaw trees back here, Oh, now we're definitely in trouble, I think, with the microphone. Excuse the noise there, guys. I think there might be... Test. Yeah, we're good. There might be a little bit of noise on the microphone just now. Um, so this, these pawpaw trees I've had for years, they finally flowered. And I thought about hand pollinating them, but I said, you know what? Let's let nature do its thing. They look so great this year. They're growing like crazy and they actually set pawpaw. The only thing here is I don't know where the pawpaws are now. <laughs> it seems like they've grown so well that it's hiding, it's either hiding the fruit or we had a windstorm recently that knocked them off and that would be really disappointing because this would be my first year with them. But I did see them get pollinated. I did see the little baby pawpaws coming out there was two of them and I didn't even have to do anything which is great so it's a good sign for the future of these trees and they will probably remain here I will not take them to the new property but they're growing really well um, what was also really strange to me was that they got pollinated without any of my help and only one of them flowered. So the one on the right flowered, the one on the left did not. So there was no cross pollination, yet they still set the pawpaw. Maybe if I can find them on here, maybe if I'm just patient later in the season, they will be, I'll have some ripe pawpaw to show you guys. But that was probably, the, this is probably the fruit I'm most looking forward to that's new um, to my yard, although I've tried it many times. Um, looking forward to that one a lot. Here's actually our quince that got chopped back by a tree branch that fell on top of it and it's coming back really strong. The same thing with these pear trees back here. They're looking really good. So I'm impressed with this whole area. There's another yosta berry there. There's some honey berries at my feet. Even over here, we got a couple bushes. This whole area has really turned into like a classic food forest that I don't really use that term very often, but that's kind of what it is. I mean, it's turning into that forest because you know here is the large shade trees above that are kind of supporting the trees below and it, well, not really, but there is plenty of mulch that I've added in here year after year. Uh, to build the soil, especially with the help of this comfrey, and we have a lot of chop and drop that way. I've added in a lot of um, wood chips over the years. And any of these broken branches that fall, I pretty much plant them or place them at the bottoms of these trees. The apples, I think, because there is, you know, so much fertility now in this area where there wasn't, I think that's actually why the apples are not flowering. And they're really growing and they've really gotten themselves established so all the wood chips I put in here and all the comfrey underneath that I constantly chop and drop they are growing like crazy those trees so that's wonderful to see but disappointing in terms of their fruit you know you can't get what you want guys every year but it is what it is we also have by the way some elderberry that we planted 
over there that hopefully in the future will give us some nice fruits. So I'm really hopeful this year for the persimmons. And I've also been really hopeful this year because I've been seeing a lot of figs this year on my trees. And this is, um, you know, we skipped an entire plot. We were on the patio. We skipped an entire plot of figs. These are some of my younger trees, not as well established. This area here doesn't even get a ton of heat, but a lot of these trees are actually starting to put out fruits, which is wonderful to see. I think we've had a great season. Also with the addition to really opening up these trees and giving them more light, it's been wonderful to see. Uh, maybe not specifically this bed, but the, the west side of the house over here, you guys can see is just filled with figs. We have more persimmons here. This is a sajo that I grafted and uh, it will not flower this year because I cut off, I think, all the budwood. We tried grafting one here, didn't take. Um, I have to re-graft this and then try it again. Um, there is some debate and I'm not really sure where I stand just yet as to when you graft persimmons. Some people say wait till later in the spring, which is about now. Um, some people say kind of right after bud, bud break, which is where I've had the most success. But we're going to try uh, this year later in the season. And I have a number of rootstock in pots that I want to graft onto to uh, essentially get myself an instant persimmon orchard when I buy myself a new property. This persimmon here is, uh, I think it's Guang Yang. This guy is not going to fruit yet this year either but it's just getting itself established these these two trees these three trees you could say really are quite young and it's good to see them really growing and very healthy all the persimmons in the yard look way better than they have i think ever we even have the marion berries here which are getting themselves established and these marion berries like i said are in other videos are really my favorite berry they're fruiting on last year's canes there is some new canes coming up, of course, but the last year canes are really where all the fruit's at. There's quite a bit of flowers, not just now, but going forward, there'll be quite a bit of flowers, probably that I'll be able to harvest a month or so from now. You can see actually the flowers, or the fruits, I'm sorry, that have set on this particular cane. That fruit right there is probably only 30 days away from being ripe, if I had to guess. The, uh, the pears look great. They're growing like crazy. I've tried really training these trees this year to really open up the form. Same thing with this Italian prune plum, where we've come in here and we've really staked a lot of the branches to grow more horizontally, establish that form a lot better. Especially that pear tree we had in the corner by... Uh, where all that shade is and all those shade trees are. The raspberries look fantastic. I've tried to stake a lot of them to give them more spacing. And I've really actually pulled out quite a bit of canes to thin this out. You really should have for each plant really only about six canes. I've come in here though and I've spaced the canes appropriately so that I can fill in this whole raised bed. These are newer strawberries here, or raspberries here. I think this is um, Anne from my buddy Luke. Thank you, Luke. And then this is a new blackberry. I think it's uh, the Olympic berry from Rain Tree. We've got, actually, even after cutting them all back in the fall, what ends up happening is they re-sprout and then you, you wait for the August crop, the crop in the summer or the fall, fall-bearing raspberries. That's what all these are. They're fall bearing raspberries, but some of them for some reason have re-sprouted and are still putting out flowers. So I'm not gonna complain. They're gonna have fruits on them, probably a bit later than expected, but you can see there's raspberries here forming and uh, they're really actually not that far away. Maybe I'll start to see them at the end of June. I normally see them, I think middle of June so that's a nice little change of pace there because there's the old canes that are gonna fruit and the new canes are growing up, not fruiting, and they're getting themselves more established for later in the season. We also have the black caps, 
which you can see are probably a lot earlier than the others. And those will be specifically for the spring or the early summer raspberry crop that I like to grow. Uh, again, just trying to train these, open these trees up. I don't really like the idea of bending this all the way down to the ground, but that was one way I was able to really open the form of that particular tree. Uh, look how many plums are in here. These are pluots. I think here is Flavor Grenade or Flavor King. Um, I can't remember the name of this one here. I have the tag of it, but this is Flavor Grenade. So these pluots are gonna be giving me so much food. I did come in here and thin these, but I'll probably come in here and actually maybe do another thinning. The tree is probably already, is considering ejecting maybe some of these, like this one here. So it's maybe probably, it's probably too much for this tree to handle. I don't know what that is, but that doesn't look good. Even though it's a big peach or a big plum, that looks like some plum cacurlio which is not great to see, but um, I have not really had any troubles with plum cacurlio in the past. And we did maybe our first year with the peaches and then eventually the problem just went away. I, I really don't know. I think it's just the health of these trees have really contributed to better pest and disease resistance. This apricot over here has got some apricots on it. I'm so excited. This is one of my favorite fruits. This is the Tomcot. And they're probably, I want to say, a month away. Eh, maybe not a month. I think they're going to be a little small this year. So maybe um, two or three weeks in actuality. We, I shouldn't have to wait that much longer, actually. I, historically, I've seen a lot of them ripen like middle of June. And we're already in early June. So, uh, you know, I would think at this point, we're probably gonna see them. The figs on this side of the yard have done exceptional. I mean, a lot of them are well-established. I didn't dig them up or move them or transplant them in any way. So they actually have fruits all up and down the branches on quite a few. Here's um, some yellow or white alpine strawberries. I'm trying to get this guy right here. Ah, what a mess. We got it though. <laughs> mm. It's quite good. I love the red ones though. I think a lot more. Those white ones kind of taste, remind me a little bit of uh, bubble gum, believe it or not. Or maybe a little bit of pineapple, but kind of getting a bubble gum sugar flavor. So here's like an example of some of the figs are now putting out fruits along these trees, even though we had pruned them way back. You can see the figs forming down there. That's LSU Tiger, and here's a, I think this is a Campaneri that's forming fruits. And we're in, you know, early June, so that's a great sign. That means a lot of these, these varieties will ripen in August, and they're in-ground trees, which is, Fantastic. Even the trees that have not received any head start, by the way, are looking good. I've been thoroughly impressed. The Azores Dark is forming fruits right now as well. Really small figs. It's hard to see them unless I zoom in for you guys. This LSU Champagne already has small figlets down there at the base. And I would argue this is one of the better varieties for this system. You can see a small fig right there. And the Dejubis are also filled with fruits, are going to be filled with fruits. They're covered in flowers all over. They're really digging themselves in. I mean, I had them in pots for years. I like the spreading habit of this one that I, well, I opened it up. It's not really its habit. But I opened it up to kind of make this more of a, a tree rather than just this column thing, you know? Uh, they're tough to get them to spread out horizontally. I have a persimmon down here I would like to graft onto. 
We have a younger persimmon right there. And I even have, you know, all in here is all kinds of flowering plants, guys, like comfrey and really all over the yard is ways to really promote pests, uh, beneficial insects, I should say. So this is a elephant garlic. I don't remember what the name is of somebody who sent me these, but thank you to whoever that was. I um, just can't think of the name right now. But these I planted all over the yard to perennialize them and they're gonna flower. And this is gonna you know, increase my parasitic wasp population here, which is really great for these persimmons specifically. Here's our really hardy citrus that we have. This has done really well. I would say maybe we could see some, some flowers this year, but I'm not hopeful. And then here on this side is the, uh, the Everest seedless grape that we really is quite young. And I decided to construct this little trellis here. Nothing too fancy, nothing too difficult. Training the vine along the bottom here, kind of like a low cordon. And then these new canes come up. You can see these nice grape clusters. By the way, all over this, this vine, it's so young. So impressed with this. Even this younger stuff down here that hasn't been growing much has got all kinds of uh, fruit on it. And then we just kind of trellis it up, tie it up to these poles, excuse me, put it up in between these two layers here and it grows and this is kind of what just is keeping it standing up. You know, it's just one way to do it. There's so many ways to train grapes. And then this is probably my favorite tree in the whole yard. Assuming it'll finally fruit or ripen its fruits instead of dropping them. This tree is looking fantastic. I've opened up the center. It used to be 20 feet tall, almost up to that window up there. And I cut out everything in the middle. Let me see if I can get you guys. Yeah, here we go. So everything out of the center was cut and now I just have this beautiful open center tree. It's tough to keep all the branches above and off the ground, but uh, I'm telling you guys, this tree could very easily put out 500 fruits. I mean, this is Rosianca. It's a cross between the American and the Asian persimmon. And uh, if it would just hold on to its fruits, which I've sort of determined, I think it's just due to a lack of light penetration. By opening up that center, we're getting more light into these trees. And, you know, each of these branches that come out of the tree in the spring gets roughly, I mean, these are actually some bad examples right here. Yeah, even this side doesn't have any fruit on it. What is going on? The second I look, <laughs> the second I look, at a particular area. Here we go, this is better. We got one, two, three, four, four new flowers on the new shoot. This shoot right here has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven new fruits. So I don't know, maybe for every new shoot that's come out, maybe there's an average of three fruits. Some of them are water shoots growing upwards and I've been trying to get rid of those. I've been coming in here and just rubbing them off or breaking them off to keep the, the form in check and keep the tree uh, still getting enough light. I think though it's still fighting itself for light because I have scaffolds at different heights, different levels. I just don't know um, if it's getting enough light, you know? And you can see where the light's hitting, but um, it's getting pollinated just like the other persimmons. We have about eight or nine trees, persimmon trees on the yard. Oh, by the way, forgot about this guy here. But look at these uh, nectarines. We have the peaches here. So many peaches just in these trees as well. There's probably 300 or so all ripen between the nectarine and these peaches. The Indian free, and by the way, the smell is amazing. The wind blows, you get that amazing smell. Here's some peaches here after I've thinned them out. The Indian blood. 
I try to keep the peaches that didn't have any damage. This is the variety that gets hit by the plum cacurlia more than any other stone fruit I have on my property, oddly enough. It's been more difficult to keep it healthy, I think. It's the least healthy of my trees. But it's been really important, I think, to come in here and thin these out. And I've been really diligent coming in here a couple times and making sure that we get good fruit quality. The, uh, the Indian free is still quite a while from being ripe. It's, I think it ripens in August, whereas the rest of these will ripen in July. And this, uh, maybe one of the white peaches over here will ripen in June, but the nectarine will ripen probably in two or three weeks, right alongside the apricot. And you can see there is still, there is some damage on this. Uh, the nectarine gets hit hard too. But I tried to keep as many of these that were in good light, and I think I'm potentially regretting that because the tree is now rejecting a good amount of these peaches, I think, or these uh, nectarines. But we'll still get a decent harvest. I mean, how many nectarines and peaches can you eat, right? Like I said, I think there's close to a thousand this year between all the trees. Maybe you could say this is one culmination, one giant tree, but there's six of them that just come together to form one. And they're all different varieties. I think there's about three, three-ish white peaches here. We get the Saturn, it's a donut peach. This is an interesting one with the shape. It's just a flat peach shaped like a donut. <laughs> uh, I still haven't really been able to evaluate the uh, flavor on those, unfortunately. So we'll see. I know, uh, Adam was really excited to uh, see what the results would be of that peach trial, the different varieties. So far, I think the Indian blood is by far the best. But we'll see if those other white peaches there can compete. Uh, I really like the white peaches at the store. If I was going to buy any white peach from a grocery store, it would be a white peach. And I think the reason for that is that the white peach growers have to ripen them more to perfection. Um, otherwise, they probably don't sell as well. So they, they offer a higher quality peach than the average yellow peach that you find at the store because they're just more ripe. And I always thought, oh, maybe I like the white peaches more, but in actuality, I just like ripe peaches. <laughs> and I think the other ones probably are better. This is my uh, pomegranate here, guys. It's doing really well. I mean, just look at it. It's really getting some size. I haven't seen any flowers just yet, whereas I have seen some flowers this year on the potted pomegranates there on the patio. Um, so maybe it's just a little bit further behind than the one or two varieties on the patio. We'll see. It did flower last year, they never set. So we'll see this year if they, they do flower and if they do set, that's kind of the problem, isn't it? We had some great asparagus harvest this year and I'm just letting them go now at this point. These spears are, were just absolutely massive. You've never seen, I've never seen asparagus like that before, crazy. And then the blueberries, these blueberries here don't even do my blueberry plants justice because although they look quite productive, these are my least productive blueberry plants. I live in blueberry haven, I'm telling you. We even grafted, by the way, I forgot about this, we grafted some Girardi mulberries and the deer came in here and topped it. Here's one that we grafted last year. Use the scion to graft two or three other trees I have now. And I'm gonna take these with me. It's amazing, by the way, how productive this mulberry is. I can't even show you, unfortunately. Um, you got the net on it right now. But, you know, that's the amazing part of this variety. It really is dwarf and it really is very productive. Maybe not the tastiest. 
Look at this blueberry, guys. Is that not insane? The whole thing just looks like a blueberry. It's like one blueberry. Look at this cluster. What the heck? Uh, this is this one though. I've noticed produces a lot of blueberries, but they're smaller. Um, this one's a little bit in the mid medium range. Still produces a lot. It sets a lot of blueberries, but they're probably on the medium in size. And then if I take you over to uh, this guy here on the, the left, he has the biggest ones. I forget the name of this guy, but it is huge clusters of blueberries. And the, the blueberries are like the size of my thumb. Pretty consistently. I wonder which one puts out a bigger harvest. But like, the thing's actually, it's bending over. It's literally, look at this. Look at that branch. It's literally bent over. It's a good problem to have. We also have persimmons here, guys, in the front. And those are fruiting. Um, this is a very young one and it actually split. You can see that there. I tried to support it, but it ended up breaking. We had a big snowstorm and we piled up a lot of the snow over here and it broke that branch. The snow was probably taller than these honeyberry plants, which you can see actually some of the fruit we're waiting, they're blue and they're fully blue, but we need to wait about two or three weeks before they turn fully blue. Now let's try one though. By the way, here's the Che we planted here. We had that one in a pot, it's the Norris, the Norris Che. It's supposed to fruit on its own, but every year it drops and the fruits look this year sort of more developed than ever. Um, all right, let's try these honeyberries because they look pretty darn ripe. But here's the thing. You know when they're ripe when they come right off the plant. These are not coming off. They've got good size. They're actually huge. Oh, this one came right off. It's such a beautiful berry as well. Look at that. I mean, this whole section of my yard is right on the main street, and I think the whole thing's beautiful. Some people might disagree when they drive by. I think it's gorgeous. And this is a gorgeous piece of fruit. I mean, it really is like as blue as a blueberry, has got that really pretty bloom on it, and then you can rub it off and make it shiny if you want. This is really soft. Still a little firm though. I hope this is right. This side's soft. Other parts of it are a bit more firm. Wow. Guys, it's, it's a really good berry. People do not give it enough credit. It's up there. Here's the thing, right? Not the sweetest berry in the world but it's so good with the, like an explosion of flavors. When it's perfectly ripe, it's got all this uh, water in it because as they expand, they get more water, they get more flavor. It really is like a kiwi, but not as sweet. Think about a kiwi and how that explosion of very f weird kiwi flavor, right? It tastes like that, but even more wild, better flavor than that, but not as sweet. And I said in the past, tastes like a kiwi plus a grape. It still kind of does taste like a kiwi plus a grape, but just not very sweet. And uh, it doesn't have to be that sweet, actually. I think it doesn't need any be to be any sweeter. I've been trying to find a variety that was sweeter, but that was really good. And I would say that berry right there is probably approaching a nine out of 10, which is crazy because I think it's better than the raspberry. I think it's about as good as the strawberry. 
It's not as good as a Marion berry, but it's close. It's one of my favorite berries. It's up there with the Gumi as well, I think. I think the Gumi beats it. But it's in my top five easily of berries that exist. I think they're, uh, you know, blueberries are good. Eh, I don't know if I can put it above a blueberry, but it's, dude, it, ah, I'm telling you, you have to grow that. You do. And people don't give it enough of a chance. I didn't give it enough of a chance, but I've been documenting these plants for years and I'm hoping that they become productive, but I didn't give up. And I said to myself, they're going to be good. These people who have been promoting them are not lying. Why would they lie to us? And I'm right. That's a real, they're right. It was a really good berry worth growing. This uh, persimmon has set and this guy unfortunately is just getting beat up by the wind. I've tried to open up the center on these guys, but that's fine how they are. It'll fill in by the end of the season. It'll get more established. They struggle early on in their lives with wind. So if you have persimmons and they're in their second or third year, they tend to get a little lanky. You want to, and they don't have fruit on them, especially if they don't have a lot of fruit. If they got some fruit, it's slowing down the growth. They won't be as lanky. They'll be less susceptible to that wind, but that's a challenge and it's not something you can really control. And this is another blueberry. It's just like stupidly productive. Guys, um, you know, we're in like year seven of this or something now. You know, um, been doing this for a while and I'm finally, you know, really getting the rewards of what I've been doing. You know, these perennials, that's just how they work. You know, if you want some instant gratification, plant yourself some uh, annuals and get really good at that. Get really good at your garden, but there's nothing like some of these perennials. They're gonna take some time. You're gonna have uh, some challenges maybe, but I would argue they're so much easier and so much more rewarding down the road because you just they just keep coming you're done I'm, I'm done i don't have to keep planting these things over and over again every year i don't have to keep working on the soil because really what we're what we do when, when the trees are young and these plants these perennials are young you just build up the soil with some mulch just keep adding the mulch over the course of three years you're gonna have so much fertility in those locations really it's all in that comfrey has been a big part of this if you have access to wood chips great um, if you have access to straw or other materials you got good compost that's awesome but really just putting down some of that uh, material and even growing the growing the mulch as a lot of people recommend it's true i mean it, it really does work out well for these trees because when you plant a fruit tree you should almost always mulch it really well, water it in well. The less competition it has when it's young, the better it's gonna get established. It's not gonna take nearly as long. Um, even though there's comfrey underneath these apples, it's done a really good job of supporting them in some way. Even though I'm constantly feeding them, the comfrey is such a great companion plant. A lot of people give it crap because it spreads out, spreads everywhere. But this one, I've been able to relatively control it um and you know for its money it's so worth it like if you're not going to plant the comfrey there's other alternatives it's not like it's comfrey or nothing but it just seems like a no-brainer to me plant yourself some grasses we have some ornamental grasses that i have in the front and you could plant them very easily next to your perennials just chop and drop them at the end of the season um, cut that mulch up a little bit and that's a free resource of straw. It's all about really just mulching these trees. The plants like to be fed other plants. So trees like to be fed trees, which a lot of these perennials are is some sort of woody material. Give them some wood that breaks down into the nutrients that they need and it just solves itself. The other big tip guys with these perennials is, um, you know, you can really get bogged down with sprays and, fer and like um, pest problems and disease problems. 
if you just plant, you take care of the soil, that's going to really help with um, a lot of your pest problems, a lot of your just in general problems. But if you also go over here and you plant things like the bee balm, you plant things like the comfrey, um, you plant things like fennel, and we looked at the uh, elephant garlic here. Let's see, what else do I have here? I even have some these annuals that are going to see. This is some chard that's going to attract beneficial insects. Um, I have some cilantro over there, but even just perennials, guys. What it really is trying to get at is plant things like sedum and fennel and get in these perennial flowering plants that attract more of these insects and beneficial insects. You won't have any pest problems. I'm struggling this year. I may struggle with some lanternfly, but that's literally it. I mean, maybe the, um, you know, the spotted wing drosophilia is kind of always a problem, but yeah, I mean, this is just, it seems like a no-brainer to me. And that's my little wisdom after this tour of doing this now for so long, what has worked and what hasn't worked and seeing all the fruits of my labor, it really does make, um, at the end of all this, it really is such a, uh, an awesome feeling. And to know that anyone can do this, it just makes you want to share what it is that you've done. So um, we'll see you soon, all right guys? Take care and uh, hit that subscribe button. You got me, you got this far, I really do appreciate it. I think we're like 46 minutes in or something. Take care guys.